The internet has been losing its collective GD mind over the Radeon RX 6500 XT practically since its announcement, and if anything, the backlash has only grown over time. The $200 price point had been woefully underrepresented during the era I call the scalper pandemic, and AMD's life jacket thrown to the largest PC gaming market turned out to be more like a pair of water wings. Despite all this well-justified criticism, however, there is a viable product here, and it does at least deserve a chance to prove itself. So, from that intro, you might think that I'm here to take it easy on AMD for the RX 6500 XT, but nothing could be further from the truth. Regardless of how powerful, or otherwise, this card turns out to be, the truth is it was something of a cluster f from the start. Conventional wisdom is that graphics card price to performance improves over time, but AMD has already shown it wasn't above nickel and diming its customers with the jump from Polaris to RDNA. And despite all the mostly justified hype around RDNA 2, its $200 offering didn't look like being any improvement at all. If early signs of performance stagnation weren't enough, when news broke that AMD had cut corners on basic features and PCIe bandwidth, plenty of PC enthusiasts were baying for Team Red's blood. I'm going to try and put all that aside and be as neutral as I can in my review. To do so, I'll be putting the RX 6500 XT through its paces on my standard test rig, the moderately priced gaming PC. Based on an overclocked Ryzen 5 5600G, I can foresee absolutely no problems with this setup whatsoever. In fact, it's precisely the kind of spec that a lot of YouTubers have been recommending for new builds in the last year or so, and I imagine that by now a lot of people who built these PCs will be in the market for one of these shiny new GPUs from their trusted friends over at AMD. Yeah, this is gonna go fine. Honestly, any doubts I had about the 6500 XT were temporarily forgotten when I booted up God of War for the first time. At 1080 original settings, the game played surprisingly well, averaging 65 FPS and barely dropping below 60 in normal gameplay. Admittedly, this is only about 5% better than the RX 480 from 2016, but an improvement's an improvement. Of course, God of War is known to slow down a lot during cutscenes and boss fights, but in this case, things were better than I expected. Apart from a few big spikes while data loaded up, the frame rate held close to 60 and dropped only into the mid 40s, and still held up better than the aforementioned Polaris card. Much like my previous testing with the RX 480 and R9 Fury X, Final Fantasy VII Remake is acting like it has a 60 FPS cap in place, when in fact it's supposed to be running at up to 120 FPS. Anyway, like those other GPUs, FF7 was prone to the odd spike in frame times that occasionally made gameplay feel less smooth than I'd like. Unlike those games, it happened multiple times and ended up bringing 1% lows crashing down to below 30 FPS. Now, as I run my games from a hard drive, I'm used to having to do multiple passes to get a smooth experience, but after my third run, things still weren't improving. Also notable were the uh, Dementor things in the cutscene that plays before I start my benchmark run. I've seen these cause slowdown on some older GPUs like the GTX 970, but the R9 290, RX 480 and Fury X all handle this section just fine. I had previously assumed it was an issue caused by VRAM capacity, but now I'm not so sure. Guardians of the Galaxy was the first title to start ringing alarm bells for me. I initially tested at 1080 medium, which I know is a bit low for cards in this performance category and was fairly concerned by the results. Even after a couple of runs, averages were only 58 FPS and minimums were frankly abysmal 24. Now, turning up to the high preset is usually not much of a challenge, with some GPUs registering no difference at all from medium, but the RX 6500 XT fell down like someone had cut its strings. Averages were just 32 FPS and minimums were a pathetic 20. GOTG is a perplexing game to test, as opening stages of the game are frequently far more demanding than the benchmark might suggest, so I'd be very hesitant to play this game on a setup like this. Forza Horizon 5, at least, seems to put things back on track. 
Performance is a slight improvement over an RX 480, perhaps in line with what might be attainable from a 580 or 590. At 1080 high, averages held at 65 FPS and 1% lows only went down to 54. As anyone who plays Forza knows, the built-in benchmark is significantly more demanding than the majority of the rest of the game, so I'd be surprised if most gamers didn't find this an immensely playable experience. Alas, there isn't really enough performance left on the table to go any higher than high without dropping below a 60 FPS average. Moving up to the Ultra preset will exceed the card's 4GB frame buffer, but dropping textures down to high results in a benchmark run of 48 FPS with lows just under 40. Hold on a sec, what the hell is this? 343 have had me thinking Halo Infinite is this ridiculously demanding beast of a game for the last few months. I could barely get above 60 FPS on a fing 980 Ti, and now this card goes and blitzes everything else I've tested this year? In single player, averages are a shade under 70 FPS at 1080 low, and just slightly higher than that in big team battle. Why this is, I don't know, it would be pure speculation on my part. But at a guess, the devs did a fair amount of optimization for current architectures and absolutely none for older ones. Now, obviously I'm somewhat pleasantly shocked by this, but it wasn't all sunshine and rainbows. I attempted to increase settings to medium to see if it were possible to get a more next-gen experience, but the game just didn't want to play ball. While frame rates were superb, this is mainly because LODs dropped sharply whenever the game looked like dropping below 60, and ended up making the game look worse than Halo Anniversary. If I'd been hoping for an upswing in numbers from the 6500 XT after Halo, I'd be disappointed. Cyberpunk performed worse than the RX 480, R9 290 and almost as bad as the GTX 970. Average FPS at 1080 medium was a paltry 33, with lows dipping below 20. If you have this card and a PC setup like this one, you'll be able to regain some performance by enabling FSR. Using the quality setting, internal resolution is dropped to 1280 by 720 and as a result, FPS increases to over 40 and 1% lows that are, well, cinematic. This is not great performance and if you're looking to upgrade your GPU specifically to play Cyberpunk, this shouldn't be on your shopping list. I have to admit, I included R6e in my benchmark roster because it was new and it was included in my Game Pass subscription, so I really have no idea about this game except its name sounds a bit rude if you say it right. I don't know if there's a good reason for it to perform worse on the 2022 6500 XT than it does on the 2016 RX 480 or 2013 R9 290, but the truth is, at least by a small margin, it does. At 1080 high, averages are 74 and lows are 50. Now, I'm quite sure this is playable and indistinguishable in gameplay from the 80 FPS averages those other cards attain, but it's still pretty unreasonable considering how new this GPU is. Splitgate, on the other hand, plays a blinder. I averaged out three matches in different arenas and saw a colossal 210 FPS on average and lows of 135. This actually puts the card in third place on my leaderboard for this game, behind the R9 Fury X and GTX 980 Ti. Of course, if you tell me you need 200 FPS in this game, I'll, I'll believe you, but from my own experience, 150 FPS and above feels really, really similar on my 144Hz monitor. Still, a win is a win, and this is a stellar performance by the 6500 XC. Call of Duty Vanguard is tough to benchmark fairly in the amount of time I have to make these videos. I play about three games of random varieties and average them out afterwards, in order to fairly represent performance both on bigger open maps and smaller, more enclosed ones. At 1080 medium, the 6500 XT performed about as well as the six-year-old RX 480, or certainly within the margin of error, and a small improvement over the near decade-old R9 290. 82 FPS is playable, and lows of 54 FPS shouldn't harm anyone's gaming experience. If you'd hoped for better though, well, you and me both. If you've skipped ahead to this point in the video, I need to point out that the RX 6500 XT's incredible performance in Fortnite is very much against the run of play. 
If you are exclusively looking for a sub £200 card for Fortnite, this is one of the best I've tested. Competitive settings at 1080 results in almost 210 FPS on average, about 5% slower than Nvidia's old flagship, the GTX 980 Ti, and over 20% faster than the RX 480 and R9 290. Performance at high with epic view distances, a little less mind-blowing, but still incredibly impressive. Although about 10% slower than the 980 Ti, this card still trounces the older Radeons, with close to 90 FPS on average, along with the standard Fortnite stutter producing disappointing lows that aren't really the GPU's fault. Like with Fortnite, Battlefield 2042 performance here is pretty remarkable. At 1080 medium, I saw an average well above 60 FPS, meaning the RX 6500 XT is, once more, faster than pretty much all of the other cards I've tested in this price range this year, which would be a hell of a result if Battlefield hadn't lost virtually its entire player base. Finally, bringing things back to a disappointing end, Call of Duty Warzone performs fine on the 6500 XT, averaging over 70 FPS with lower than usual minimums of 42. I try to drop in roughly the same area each time I play, so I'm reasonably confident when I say the RX 480 performed a little better, especially at the low end, but frankly it's close enough that it might as well be called a tie. So, what gives? Surely this is a mistake, it can't be this inconsistent. Well, you might have noticed in the PC spec section of the video, I was a teeny tiny bit sarcastic about my expectations for the review. You see, the Ryzen 5 5600G, a 2021 CPU based on AMD's current Zen 3 architecture, doesn't support PCI Express Gen 4. Even if it did, I also chose to build the system on an MSI Tomahawk B450 motherboard, which likewise doesn't support PCIe 4. One of the corners AMD cut in the making of the RX 6500 XT was that they only wired up the interface for four lanes of PCI Express. At Gen 4 speeds, this would be adequate for a card of this performance level, but at Gen 3 speeds, that means we have a bottleneck. While not every game is stressing the PCIe interface enough to cause major loss of performance, clearly some games are. Cyberpunk, Rainbow Six Extraction, Guardians of the Galaxy and Final Fantasy VII Remake all appear to be performing worse than I would have expected, even with my already fairly low expectations of this GPU, and I suspect the reason for this lies in my system's lack of PCI Express Gen 4. Now, if my choice of CPU and motherboard were the exception to the rule, then I'd accept some criticism about my choosing to make this video. In fact, I might not even have bothered. The thing is, in the world of budget PC building, Ryzen APUs and 10th gen Intel CPUs have been among the best value, most highly recommended options for more than a year, and a lot of people will have built modern, high performance systems in that time that only support PCIe Gen 3. This all means that a lot of budget PC owners will be in the same position I was making this video, stuck with a motherboard or CPU that can't get the full performance out of the 6500 XT. Now, of course, I wasn't going to upgrade my test rig just for this GPU, and I wouldn't suggest anyone else do so either. However, I am working on a complete budget PC build based on this GPU and a fully PCIe Gen 4 compatible CPU and motherboard combo. If you're interested in seeing that video, keep an eye on the channel in the next couple of weeks. As for a conclusion to this video, however, I can't really make a fair one. If I'm going to make a recommendation about this card one way or another, it needs more context. That means comparing it to other cards available for between one and 200 pounds, both new and used, and we'll have to take in considerations like power usage and driver availability. That's far too much to fit into the outro to this video, so my more holistic, balanced view of the RX 6500 XT and its competitors will have to wait for another video. In the meantime, thanks for watching, kindly do the usual YouTube things if you feel so inclined, and I'll see you next time. <laughs>